welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, this is the last day of the Year of Magical Thinking. The process started many, many, many months ago in November. We started planning it. So it has spanned this year of uh, magical thinking for us. So we are happy that you are with us on our final day. Um, the first talk back was focusing on putting it together, the making of. So we had Pan American Film Division. Many of you were on the call for that one. And then last Thursday was um, uh, creating a character. So we had Victoria and Kyle, the director, and our ASL interpreter and our drama, Katie Mallinson. But today, I am excited to introduce you to our team of designers. So these are the folks who actually create the magic of the look of the production. Um, we have almost everybody today, which is excellent. And um, we have all of our designers, but we don't have um, uh, one of our um, stage managers and we don't have Kyle today, but, um, but I will, I'll speak on their behalves. So today it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to, I'll do it in the order of my camera. Uh, we have Susan Drozd, who is our resident hair and makeup designer. And she was our hair and makeup designer for CMART and also for the Year of Magical Thinking. We have Jason Clark. Hi, Jason. So Jason is our lighting designer for the Year of Magical Thinking. He also designed the lights for CMART. And we end um, one more this past season. Um, remind me which one it was, Jason. I'm sorry. It was... Uh, I also designed uh, Tis Pity. Tis Pity. That's right. Tis Pity. So if you remember the hanging candles with the red ribbons on it, that was seems like years ago now, but designed Tis Pity. So welcome, Jason. Uh, we have Michelle Eisen. Hi, Michelle, who is our production stage manager and has stage managed countless productions at the Irish Classical. I'm sure by now you have seen her in the lobbies during our productions. And she was our production stage manager for CMART, as well as the Year of Magical Thinking. Hi, Michelle. We have Jessica Wagrin. Hi, Jess. And Jess, hi, so you may recognize Jess from some productions. Um, we most recently performed in An Ideal Husband, which was several years ago, <laughs> most recently it was years ago. And since then, uh, Jess has designed um, Hamlet, which was in 2018, set and costumes for that, and also designed um, the costumes for and set for a year of magical thinking. Hi, Jess. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have last but certainly never least, Tom McCarr. Hi, Tom. He is our resident sound designer. Tom has designed every sound you have heard <laughs> at Irish Classical, pretty much. And he has done uh, C-Marks and also Year of Magical Thinking. We also have Cassie Cameron on the call today. Hi, Cassie, our Director of Development. And surely you recognize her from past productions, um, The Night Alive and Golden Boy, award-winning turn in Golden Boy. And she is helping us with uh, the controls behind the scenes today. So this is our panel and we are excited to kick it off. Um, we have everybody's cameras on um, today. So uh, go ahead and throw your questions into the chat box and I will uh, take them from there, but I'll just kick a question off to the group uh, from the beginning. So I think it's fair to say that despite this year, we would consider you theater designers. That is what you do mostly, and that is hopefully what you will go back to doing once we move into in-person performances. So my question, first question is, how has this process changed so much to design for the screen as opposed to live theater and anybody can kick it off to start us off. I can probably start with that. Okay. Um, the biggest challenge and also um, one of the most exciting parts about designing for CMARKS or CMARKS, <laughs> your magical thinking is um, the fact that the scenic elements, um, they did not have to, there was so much expansion in the way I could think about um, how Vicky would move around the scenic elements, knowing that the camera would follow her and it would move around her and that I didn't have to focus so much on um, the limitations of of you know of sight lines of, for the audience. Um, so that was really exciting for me. Um, the Andrews is 
as we know in the round and that was really just so cool to think of it as this like totally expansive space that was just kind of like a, a big black hole which can be really scary and then you think oh wait no anything can happen in this space now because it can, it, we don't need to know that this is the Southwest corner. We don't need to know that that, and so that was just so freeing in a way um, and, and exciting. It was challenging to kind of track and know how to use it effectively. And conversations with Kyle and Pan American really solidified, you know, my design choices of putting the paintings um, hanging um, and moving them. And I don't even know if audience members know that they, that they move um, so that they work in our favor, but that, that, was, that was different, challenging and exciting. Wonderful. Thanks, Jess. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder that Jess did the set and the costumes for your magical thinking. So if you have questions on either of them, um, we'll shoot them Jess's way. Thanks. And, and I can jump in from a world of lighting, uh, much, much like C marks before, uh, lighting for for camera and lighting for a live audience in a intimate space like the Andrews are two radically radically different things, and it has really been a journey in these last two productions uh, for me as a designer and and uh, a practitioner of the craft to really see what the camera is seeing and and learn how that translates differently than the human eye that we would be seeing as an audience member. Uh, I don't, I guess I don't mean it to sound uh, sloppy, but when we're in a live performance, there's a little bit more that you can get away with, um, especially as people are moving in and out of, of maybe sight lines or shadows um, from a lighting design standpoint. If we're capturing everything live on camera, you don't really have a whole lot of wiggle room. Uh, so everything's really just got to be perfect and spot on it's uh the process has been much more uh much less roller uh full of paint and way more tiny little uh <laughs> smallest brush you can possibly find uh kind of painting with light uh on these last two projects and really learning uh in the lighting world intensity uh, is referring to the brightness of the lights and how ratio and contrast are perceived by the human eye. It's radically different when uh, we're recording it to, to a digital platform like a camera. So really getting into the difference between the human eye and, and what a camera is seeing, it, it really has changed all of the elements of, of lighting design. And really uh, it's been a very uh, rewarding journey to further my craft and get better at what I do uh, in, this new, in this new format. Wonderful. Thanks, Jason. I can go next. Um, uh, I would say that normally when I design for the theater, I'm with everybody all the way till opening night. And then I leave and I check in once a week. Um, when you're doing film, you stay. And it's actually, it's glorious and lovely because you get to be in the art while it's happening all the time. And so um, for me, I, when I'm in the theater and it's live, I'm backstage, I'm listening. So I'm really relying truly on my other senses um, to know if like I'm needed during tech by way of, um, I'll be, I'll watch, but I go back and forth. Basically, I'm running in and out of the theater all the time. And then once it opens, I'm not really in where I could help. So I will rely on my senses there. I wanted to make sure I was clear on that. Um, but when we are doing film, I'm in the room a lot. And so I'm watching it and, and doing my best to take care of the actress, not just, or actors, not just, of course, what they look like, but also to make sure they're feeling like they're taken care of. And they're, um, the people that are up in their space, literally, are also giving them some good energy and just being with them and being, um, being part of the process that changes as minutely as Jay was saying, where Make sure a piece of hair, a piece of hair, is like in the right spot. Um, hope that everything stays the same. Knowing that um, Jess and I got to tag team a lot, where I would go fix her hair, and then her scarf would change. So Jess would go up and change her scarf, and then I'd go back and fix her hair, and like it would go back and forth that way too. And when we're in live, we don't. The actors, we send them out on their way, and they do their work and carry our designs with them. So that was different. That's different in my my world. Great. Thank you, Susan. 
Tom, would you like to add anything? Well, you're muted. You're muted. I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> CMARS was in education. We handled the tech of the sound as if we were doing a live performance. Um, so that the uh, stage manager was playing all the sound when they came up in in the script, and this is that was how you would handle it for live. Um, two things happened: the actors preferred to do dress rehearsals without sound, um, and both the director and I, I had no problem with it. I redid all almost all of the sound for C marks when I saw the video. What? would be effective for that particular um, movie, what was effective in the theater, how it felt when the sound was coming from speakers around you, behind you, um, just didn't have the same effect when you're watching a, a, a screen at home. Um, and so I redid most of the whole show, which I was happy to do because I wanted it to be what it should be. Um, so, when we did Year of Magical Thinking, um, took that education and uh, the director Kyle and I had many talks uh, throughout the uh, rehearsal process about where it was going and what she was looking for um, as the performance evolved. And all I did, what I would be doing is what I call um, collect a palette of sounds mm. um, to be ready for the fine to work with the final product without preconceiving, especially for this particular piece where it would go. Um, so that um, I, we didn't bother rehearsing with the sound in the theater, it was pointless. Um, the, the sound was decided and added after when, when the filming was done and as it is done in a film. Um, it was added afterwards to perfect, to hopefully to perfectly suit that the video. And um, as usual, um, well, Kyle and I had talked and um, about what the final notion would be, but it wasn't exactly what we expected it to be, as it should be. It, it was a living, breathing thing. A, a play is a create, you know, is a living thing, and the performance was not exactly what I expected, which was great. Which, so I didn't have, I didn't, it wasn't, I wasn't forcing any sort of uh, sound on uh, right. to make it what I expected it to be. I could deal with what it was. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it happened that, as usual, um, I probably had. Um, we probably, the director, which was fine. Uh, it, I, I prefer to come in with more cues and more sounds than are needed rather than having to come up with something at the last minute so that the uh, so that quite a bit of it was caught, what po the possibilities with, you know, between the agreement of Kyle and myself. Um, but yeah, it was a, it's a, it, it's a, that was just what, that was the difference um, mm -hmm. between what you would do for a, for a, for a live for a play that was performed live and for a recorded play, right? Understood. And also, I'm I'm glad that some of you who have worked on C marks could talk about the difference between C marks and this one because we were we were really flying by the seat of our pants in a lot of ways with C marks and just kind of learning the process. And Year of Magical Thinking um, helped us to solidify some of that. Although the show itself is so incredibly different than C marks, so again, we were kind of learning anew. And um, I'll just pause for a second here and remind folks that this is the last day uh, to view CMAR, or to listen to me, to view the Year of Magical Thinking. So if you haven't already, you have until midnight tonight to check it out. Um, I'm sure some of you who are on the call have already seen the production. And so you're probably taking back the images and moments of the design um, while we're speaking. But let's backtrack for a second and just talk about the process of design because we may take for granted because we live in this world of how it goes and what the steps are, but for the year of magical thinking in particular, because it is a one person show without any stage directions. I mean, if you were to look at this script, uh, it reads like one of her novels. There's no, there's, there's a little bit of setting in terms of what year it takes place in. Um, 
but it's so different than like a Tennessee Williams script where you would have like the light shaft comes through the window at a 45 degree angle, you know, and all of the, the guidance. Um, so can we talk a little bit about creating the world of this play, which is really just taking place in her mind. It's not in a linear manner. And um, while everybody's thinking of that, I'm actually going to pitch it to Jess and Susan because thinking about Vicky's look, so specific, one, one look, sometimes in a play, a character is dressed five, six, seven times to really get the personality across. This is your one opportunity. And not only that, but we shot over the course of three days. And so that, and even though we went in order, it's like, you have to go back to that look and remember where her hair was laying in that last moment of the last day. So just talking a little bit about the process of designing her look and how that changes throughout. And then we can check in with Jane and Tom. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, both, uh, yeah, we can definitely focus on the costumes, but what I will say is both the scenic and, and costume, design was really for me more than any other show I've ever designed, just a meditation on the text, a meditation while I was reading it, letting things come to me naturally, not trying to force any kind of design because it was so much less about, uh, I could not fall back on the research of a time period or, you know, just the practicality of, she was walking outside, she would, you know, and she didn't mm -hmm. even pack it, things like that. But um, it could be anything, um, which is terrifying. And also, again, so exciting. So I just relied on, I'm a huge Joan Didion fan. I have read many of her books. Um, and also remembering that this is not Joan Didion. This is an every woman character. This is this is a, a performance on grief and 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 kind of just, continuing on. And so um, the first thing I really want to just say is that just totally soaking myself, just like immersing myself into the text was the only way to just, I just started seeing, boop, beep, bop, bop, you know, little things mm -hmm. like popping up that looked like her, this person. There was also a very intimate conversation with Kyle, Susan, myself and Victoria about what some of the characters emotions looked like on Vicky because this was such a such an intensely personal performance that how Victoria felt when she kind of pulled herself up by her bootstraps by 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 you know like if that's what that feels like to her what that looks like to her because we all do this we all have our kind of coats of armor that we put on ourselves like truly, you know, our, our physical mm -hmm. clothing that make us feel like we can get through the day. Um, so we had conversations like that, which were so cool because that's not always applicable for shows. It's just, it comes down to the nitty gritty of, of, of what needs to be, what, what parts of the story need to be told with costume or with scenic elements. This one was so much more personal. Um, it was really a beautiful collaboration between Victoria, myself, Kyle, and Susan. I mean, we came up with her look that felt personal because it had to be, because you had to believe Victoria, what she was going through in that time. And also that it could be any woman. Um, and I also got a little nod to Joan Didion with her scarves because it's iconic mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there's something so comforting about a big scarf, a blanket around you. And that was really inspiring to me. Um, so that's kind of the approach where the process on this one, it was so much less research and so many more conversations, which really felt so lovely. Um, I have to say, I mean, the whole performance, like Susan said, we were there for Victoria we were there to make her look great, but to really support her through this very intense journey that the actor went through mm -hmm. performing this piece. Um, and that was so special, so, so special. I can give it over to Susan. That's wonderful, <laughs> thanks Jess. Yeah. The only thing I would, would add to what Jess said, which was all very true. And I watched Jess through her journey doing exactly what she just said. Um, where just it was a meditation on text. And I felt it, I felt it in her paintings. I felt it in um, 
the way she took care of each piece of costume, which did change for Jess. Like she had a switch in the, like before we started shooting where um, she did keep going back to like, but I need it to be honor the text. What I would say for me was maybe a meditation on Victoria for like, because I was going to follow Jess's lead. A lot of times costume designers design and I, I, not to sound lofty, it's like icing on the, my stuff is like, the, it's not the icing on the cake, like it makes it decorative, but like I have to compliment totally. what the other designers do. And so um, this was Kyle really saying, hey, I, I don't ever think about hair and makeup at all. Like in a beautiful way, she goes, I'm going to trust you, but I'll, I'll give you my opinion every step of the way. And she did wonderfully. Like we would send pictures back and forth um, or if um, we had this wonderfully, like almost like a tense moment for a second because we had sent Vicky to get her hair cut um, and we all approved this. We, I mean, anytime a haircut happens for an actor, it will be proposed either by the director or uh, designers. We will have a discussion about it. Then I go and talk to the actor and go, okay, so we're going <laughs> to, how do you feel about this haircut or a hair dye or shave the beard? doesn't matter. It depends on the actor. And we, and I go and I chat with them. And then because this was very personal and a meditation on Vicky, I said, where do you like to go? Where do you, who do you trust? What do you do? So she booked an appointment. I told her exactly what we wanted. And her hairdresser that day happened to get a little excited and cut off a little more than we wanted. And so there was this moment where I always actually have the actors send me a selfie. I have like I've got such a dictionary of actor selfies, um, normally in their car after their haircut or shave or coloring. And I was like, oh, she looks so cute and she looks younger. Oh, okay. So I quickly took the picture and like sent it to Kyle. And I said, hey, um, I'm going to put it side by side of our research. I'm going to show you what it looked like in our photo shoot when her hair was pulled back so that you don't panic when she comes to rehearsal. And so that conversation happened. And then we even had another email back and forth with Jess involved. And we were just like, this will work for us. A nice, like a haircut, the way it, will, the way it will set and stay it had to be practical. It had to be out of her face so that Jay's lighting was able to catch her. It had to last three days. Um, and I loved the marriage of that. So it was really making sure Vicky felt good. I didn't want her going to rehearsal, worrying about something she had no control of when she was in the hair salon chair. But I also wanted to work with what she had and I didn't want the director or the costume designer to worry either. So that that's a that's a fun part of my job as well that I guess I never get to talk about. But that's one of the things um, that was that was part of that as well. I think too like like we were saying, you know, having it be for the camera. It's like every single detail matters so much. So so now we're talking about you know, I know it was more than an eighth of an inch, but even if it was like an eighth of an inch of a haircut, that's huge on camera. It really makes a difference. So it's 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 even more um, apparent when these things shift, especially over the course of days. So you brought up Jay's lighting and Jay, talk to us a little bit about what it was like to light I won't say in a void, but it could have been seen in a void because um, Vicky's costume was black the black background. Um, but if for those folks who have seen the show already, not once does it feel like you are, that Vicky's disappearing. And if there is that moment um, where maybe the lines are blurred, it's completely intentional. So just talk to us about lighting with, uh, within this world. Yeah, absolutely. It was an incredibly uh, fun idea to try and isolate down uh, to this black void of a space that we were trying to achieve uh, in conversations with Kyle and, and Jess. Jess's set design really was this beautiful concept of uh, kind of random enclosure and yet uh, complete isolation. And, and uh, the incorrect lighting choice really could have ruined that whole concept for both the director and Jess's beautiful set design. And so one of the challenges that uh, presented us uh, was presented to me was to try and make this feel closed in yet we're completely lost and we don't know where we are. We're in this black void. Uh, and originally, uh, I know Jess didn't mention this before, but actually the, the costume changed. 
uh, we we showed up to a dress rehearsal, and uh, there was a conversation that was had, and the 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 color of Vicky's uh, shirt had changed, and uh, all of these things were all kind of this perfect storm with the lighting to make things really pop. And part of my portion of creating this world was to accomplish the task of illumination and not lose the actor into this black void yet maintain the black void and also shift uh, if you've already seen the show you'd know uh, it might be difficult to notice but actually that whole show is occurring in 360 degrees she's facing a different direction in the theater every time that camera cuts so to maintain the proper ratio on her face and uh, the backlighting, so the backlighting is actually what keeps her popping out. Uh, there's about, my goal is that if you look at that show, you would think that there's, the lights are on and that's it. There's actually about 85 light cues in that show. Mm -hmm. And all of that is to accomplish all of these little tiny minute details uh, in order to help the whole thing sync together. That's really the job of a lighting designer. Uh, in most projects, some of them can be super showy, uh, but really all of it is to serve the text and to serve the vision of everyone's design together. And that's why I'm so drawn to the profession, honestly, is because you are sort of responsible for holding all of these elements together. And one errant movement could really mess someone else's beautiful work up. And, and I, I like the challenge. Such a, such a great way to capture it too. Um, I think, I don't know I, I, um, if the collaboration aspect of it is like lesser or greater, but I know that it needs to be there when it's on film, um, even as much as um, with theater, because it's all being seen at once and people can pause it and they can come back to, it's like there's a microscope under it. So all of the aspects of the design really need to be in tandem. Mm -hmm. So Tom, I'll, I'll bring it back to you. Um, you had mentioned earlier that you had prepared many pieces or a palette of, of um, sound design, but at the very end, it, it, it came to pass that only certain ones were chosen. So how does that choice, how is that choice made? How, how do we decide the music or the sound design will go here only or there only? How do we strip away? Well, um, first, the, the, uh, the, the need in a, a one-woman show like this, there is a, a need, I think, and the, uh, most directors agree, to um, put enough sound in there to refresh the audience's um, attention. Mm -hmm. um, just a little something to reset so that hearing the same uh, one voice over, um, so it's not a lecture, um, but rather it's a, a stage performance. So that's the first thing we're trying to accomplish. Um, on this particular piece, um, which also, I guess it applies generally, um, if the actor is accomplishing something just by their expression, their voice, um, don't gild the lily. Um, don't distract from that. Um, what in this, also in this piece, for this piece, one of the, I, uh, one of the uh, concepts of Joan Didion's piece was uh, the central characters disassociation to be able to deal with all this grief and that's the magical thinking so um the trick on this particular one was to have just in in the right places to uh give vicky a place to live in her mind um of those places where she had to pull herself back and disassociate and use magical thinking to slowly in her way, deal with, the, with this grief. So that, but the trick with that for this particular, for this or uh, this piece especially was that sort of thing can make it sound like a horror movie or, or, or <laughs> um, yeah. it's, a, it, it's a fine line between the, and I, I used more textures than melodies uh, in, this, in this piece. So it, it was, 
just between Kyle and myself and, and what in the video to, to use just enough to um, break it up so that, you know, the different, uh, different chapters, the different, uh, I think they're called move, she mm -hmm. uh, don't yeah. treat, treat it like a musical piece. The different movements are, you help the, I mean, I don't know if it's help the audience, but just, it's like a lighting change. It's just give them a, there is no change of set. So a bit of a change of texture in the sound. And hopefully most of the sound was, was meant to be almost subliminal. Mm -hmm. Some of them were just like a, pa like a, a passing sense, not even an emotion, but a, a sense of what she was, you know, would be going through. So yeah. um, once again, the things that were eliminated were the things that didn't need anything. <laughs> So the look, the, the camera work, her expression, her movement, whatever, her, her tone, there's no reason to add anything. And I especially stayed away from anything that got too emotional on the emotional level, didn't need anything more. Yeah. So that's how we cut things. Just done so beautifully. And I, I can still hear some of it in, in my mind. Um, it, yeah, just really served to guide us through this meditation, so just beautiful. Um, we are almost uh, to our time. Well, we are at our time, but we would be remiss if we didn't hear from Michelle. Uh, Michelle, I'm just curious, I've got one last question um, and it goes to you. So having done countless, countless, countless live performances at the Andrews, just walk us through what, the, what some of the exciting challenges are of putting two shows now on film and, um, and just anything you'd like to share with us. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I think we already covered that we learned a lot on CMARCs <laughs> and, uh, the approach for CMARCs was, as Tom stated, we, we treated it like a staged production that we were then going to film and, and present to the world, which I don't think was the wrong approach, given that it was our first one. And really CMARCs is a play and it's structured like a play. So it had a lot of, um, the conventions that a, a play would have set changes and costume changes and time changes. And so we, we approached it that way and we learned a lot and we did have to make certain adjustments based on the fact that it was going to be filmed and presented in that way. What I think was great about Year of Magical Thinking is that it was such a, a sort of a, a blank palette in terms of how we were able to present it that we didn't have to rely on those theatrical conventions that we're so used to relying on in our, our business. So it really gave a lot more freedom in terms of how we structured rehearsal process. I mean, for me, that's a huge, uh, huge part of my job is making sure that we have a plan for how we're going to get from that first read through to the point where we would be doing a final preview before we open a show that that didn't exist in this process. So while the beginning part was very similar, you know, laying it out there and planning the movement and setting the blocking and in that sense I didn't have to worry about how many full runs of this were we going to get in before we opened because that wasn't how it was going to be done we were never going to film it in a full run you know normally I've got my stopwatch out and I'm timing everything and I'm making sure that we're sticking to that time so we know that we're not lagging anywhere and that just I had to train my brain my stage manager brain to sort of put that on the back burner and realize that there were things that were more important to this type of process. And it, it's great. It's, you know, learning things that in 15 years of doing the same type of role, I, I never really had to encounter. And uh, that was awesome. I find myself now watching films and watching TV shows and being like, oh, that was a cut. Oh, that, you know, stuff that you just don't, you never ever, you don't think about that. Live theater is the, the play starts and the play ends and you know it's kind of a jesus take the wheel in some cases where you're off and you're off and running i mean there's a live audience there there's no there's no going back you know if if you know something happens and a light cue jumps or an actor jumps a line you know that's just that's part of the process and the magic and sometimes the terror of what of what we do and with this there was a really nice sense of calm in the fact that oh we you know we missed that we needed to shift that bench, the slight angle before we started filming that. We're just going to cut and we're going to go back and we're going to shift that and we're going to go on and no one's the wiser. And that was, that was great. That was a really sort of nice way to relax into that. But um, 
it also had challenges because it's, you know, teaching an old dog new tricks. You know, I'm like to have a very firm control <laughs> of what's going on. And there's a lot of times in this process where um, I, that wasn't what I had. That wasn't my role in this. You know, I wasn't driving this, driving this bus. There were other people in, in charge once we got to the point where cameras were brought in. And so, you know, it was a nice little life lesson for myself, I think. Um, it was great to be able to work with the designers almost in a little bit of a different capacity, especially Jay and I. Um, I don't usually have the designer sitting with me for that long of a duration. So there was a lot of teamwork when it came to, you know, he set this light cue for this particular movement and now we've got a camera here and guess what? It's not, it's not working the way that we thought it was gonna work. It's not working that way anymore. So, you know, being able to stop and go back and fix those things where we wouldn't, we'd never be able to do that in a live production. That's just, that's just not what it is. So it was, it was cool. It was great. It's, it's been an adventure for sure. Yes, it has. I think that we have all learned so much over this year and and thank you for reinforcing all of those changes, challenges um, and new things that we've learned over the course of this year. And I would imagine some things that we will bring into our process even when we return um, back into in-person performances. So I hope that this has drawn back the curtain and helped everybody kind of see or remember the year of magical thinking in a different way, hearing from our brilliant designers. Thank you to our panel of designers for spending your, your Sunday with us and giving us some, uh, some additional aspects to think about while thinking about the show. If you haven't checked out the show already, you have until midnight this evening. So hop on to Irish Classical and grab your ticket. It. Thank you to everybody who has supported us both for this production, for C Marks, and just over the years, Irish Classical. Um, we are very, very excited to have the support of everybody and also to be moving forward through the summer and into next season. So, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and be well. Thank you. So long, everybody. Thank you.